Shannon joined the Electrochemical Society in September 2016 as Director of Membership Services and was promoted to Director of Community Engagement in January 2019. At ECS, he works to enhance community engagement, increase the value of ECS membership, grow educational and professional development opportunities, and support constituent experiences. Through his experience with academia and scholarly societies, Shannon has in-depth expertise in organizational growth, community development, customer service, diversity and inclusions, and challenging the status quo. Without further delay, I would like to hand over the mic to Dr. Shannon uh, to begin with his session. Thanks, Neha. Uh, appreciate the introduction. Um, I'd like to give everybody a little bit more background on the Electrochemical Society, um, ECS. We are a nonprofit professional society that was established in 1902, so we have been around for 120 years. And our mission and objective is to advance the theory and practice at the forefront of electrochemistry and solid state science and technology and those allied subjects. We have a robust global membership of researchers um, that provide innovative solutions to major challenges. We also host prestigious meetings twice a year, publish research and foster education and collaborate with other organizations like Inago. We know that electrochemistry has a broad depth um, and, and wide array of technical uh, domain. So we've broken up our uh, technical interest areas into 13 different divisions ranging from battery and corrosion to sensors, high temperature energy materials and processes, organic and biological electrochemistry and physical and analytical electrochemistry. ECS does have a membership base. We have approximately 6,500 to 7,000 members. Um, and our membership community helps to facilitate, we help to facilitate the research and discovery through our ECS meetings by convening scientists around the world, providing professional support through your lifetime career, um, as well as mentorship opportunities across various stages of your career and help you build those relationships and nurture your partnership and teamwork. Most aligned with today's webinar, uh, ECS does publish a family of journals. We have the Journal of the Electrochemical Society, which is our flagship journal being published since 1902, followed by the Journal of Solid State Science and Technology, which was launched in 2012. And most recently, we have launched two gold open access journals, sensors, ECS Sensors Plus and ECS Advances. You can learn more about this information at electrochem.org forward slash publications. And as I had previously mentioned, we also host meetings. Um, we have our upcoming meeting this fall in Atlanta, Georgia from October 9th through the 13th. It is the 242nd ECS meeting and registration for that event is now open. We will be in Boston, Massachusetts next spring at the end of May, followed by Gothenburg, Sweden next fall of 2023 in October. You can learn more about our meetings at electrochem.org forward slash meetings. And with that brief introduction, I would like to um, turn everything over to Despina to begin the formal presentation on how to boost citations tips for researchers. Thank you, Shannon. That was interesting. We would request the attendees to share their questions for Shannon in the question box. We will address those later towards the end of this session. I would now like to hand over the mic to Dr. Despina, our second speaker. Dr. Despina is an award-winning medical researcher with 181 publications in renowned medical and biomedical journals. The impact of her work 
is demonstrated by 5,000 plus citations that she has to her credit. She is also the recipient of more than 20 research grants. As a publication and training consultant with Enago Academy, she conducts webinars and workshops to help researchers understand the nuances of academic writing and publishing. To date, Dr. Sanadu has attended more than 200 national and international conferences as an invited speaker, served as a peer reviewer for 41 international journals and chaired several seminars. She's also on the editorial board of multiple international and scientific journals. Uh, we extend a warm welcome to her and thank her for joining us today. Thank you very much, Niha, for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you today. So the agenda of this presentation will uh, focus on the following five items. First of all, ways and importance of acknowledging the sources in a manuscript. Two, understanding the significance of promoting your research. Awareness of various strategies to boost citations how to effectively use academic and social, uh, social media networks, and five, measuring the impact of the applied promotion strategy that you're pursuing. So let's start with the first uh, step, first uh, point in our agenda, ways and importance of acknowledging the sources when preparing your work for publication. So how do we do that? We use citations. What are citations? Just, just to set the basics for our discussion, when we use the term citation, we mean uh, the text reference and acknowledgement of any documented information in another document. Now, this will include uh, our reference list, which corresponds to a complete list of citations appearing at the end of the document and it illustrates the interconnection of scientific ideas between the existing literature and the current research. So it's very important not only to acknowledge uh, the sources of the material that you may be referring to, the material you may be using to perform parts of your work, but also to show how your own work connects to what has already been uh, known has already been published in the field. Now, why should authors cite? There's a number of very important reasons. Now, first of all, it shows respect uh, for uh, the individuals and the work that you're citing. So it acknowledges the work of other scholars. This is extremely important uh, because the same way you uh, want your work to be acknowledged, it's important for the others. To, to feel the same way. It shows respect to academic writing standards. This is the official uh, way to do it, the fair way to do it. It facilitates literature survey. It makes it easy for uh, others to identify your sources, look them up, read more uh, about them. It gives credibility to your work. It provides the evidence that supports the statements made in the paper. It helps others trace the source of that work and demonstrates awareness of the relevant literature, your awareness, your in-depth understanding and knowledge of the field, and therefore, in a way, uh, gives more credit, increases the importance, the validity of your work, because it's all put in perspective. Now, what should authors cite? We need to cite any um, quotes, of course, by another person, direct uh, or in or interpreted, paraphrased. Anything that we quote needs to be uh, acknowledged and cited as such. Any original research that we've taken into consideration that we are referring to, uh, results of which we are mentioning, comparisons to which we are making, any rel anything relevant to other sources. When we mention them, 
uh, or use them in any way in our text, we need to refer to them. Statistics from another source, for example, populations, results of surveys, etc. Any tables, figures, diagrams, any images that have been created by someone else need to be acknowledged. The source needs to be acknowledged. Also, if we are bringing up any controversial facts, opinions or dates from another source, we need to, to provide that source. And of course, if we've used data from other studies, even if we've incorporated them in a meta-analysis that's been performed, we need to acknowledge that source. Very important. Now, what we don't need to cite, this is also important to understand. We don't need to cite historical overviews, summaries of historical events, for example, uh, that are just uh, mentioned by multiple sources. Um, any uh, own observations, your own observations or findings, your ideas or your own research results, uh, they only need to be cited if you've published them elsewhere and therefore you need to cite that publications of yours, even if it's yours, but if it has not been published, it's your idea, it's your thought, it's your findings, you don't need to provide uh, a citation. Conclusions don't need a citation because they're your conclusions from your um, thinking, your processing. In a manuscript, you would have already acknowledged the sources that you used um, to retrieve data from or uh, information from. But in your conclusions, these are yours. And also anything that's common knowledge. They, these would not need a citation. Info, information that can be found in a significant number of sources. Now, different types of citation data. We have articles um, that um, get cited and have a citation impact. We have authors that get cited uh, and then you have the number of their papers that have been cited, the number of citations these authors have received, the average number of citations these authors have received. And then we have different metrics to uh, measure, if you want, the impact of uh, the work of a person, of a scientist. And there's different metrics such as the H index or the G index and various other metrics that at different times or different places are um, used more frequently. So me by measuring the citations, in a way you can appreciate the impact that an article has had or an author has had or even a journal has. That's how we have the journal impact factor. It takes into consideration the citations that the articles published in that journal have received. And then this is used again to make various calculations for different um, factors and indices used to measure the impact of a journal, such as, for example, the Egan factor, which is a quantitative and qualitative, qualitative marker. Now, so what is a citation count? Uh, for example, when it comes to a paper, this is an example here, you see the title of the paper, um, you, you, you see some, some information, the author and uh, the date, but you also see how many people have cited this uh, paper, this uh, manuscript, this publication. So for example, this specific one was published in 1951 and since it's been cited by 213,000 uh, other uh, sources, other publications. So a citation count uh, is the frequency of citations received by researchers for a previously published article. It is used as a reliable measure of the significance of the source of information. And that's why it's so important to cite uh, the work of others. And this is why it's so important to have your work cited by others. It's a measure of significance at the end of the day. 
it facilitates the process of knowing the impact of a journal as well as assessing and analyzing relevant publications in a particular field of interest. For example, how impactful has your publication been in the specific field? How many citations has this manuscript of yours received in comparison to other manuscripts in this field at the same time or in comparison to other manuscripts in the same journal or in the same department? There's many Many different ways to look at it. And then there are citation analysis tools that count citations from different sets of publications in order to fully capture an article's impact. Of course, there are limitations um, of citation metrics, and it's important to bear these in mind. Citing errors can result in separate ent entries and missed counts. Um, so, for example, an article can be cited in two or three or more different ways. If this happens, it's a very unfortunate scenario because the counts each one of these different versions in a way received will be counted separately and you won't be able to get the full, the total count. Inconsistencies in author or institutional names can lead to separate entries and missed counts. That's also a problem. You must make sure, for example, that your name appears with the exact same spelling in every publication that you have. Otherwise, it will be counted as different individuals. So, for example, if you spell it with a C or with a K um, or uh, other versions thereof, it will be counted as a different individual. Um, another issue is boosting metrics through self-citation. This is an undesirable uh, practice uh, and can lead to miscalculation of the true impact of one's work. The number of reads are not accounted for by citation metrics. So uh, your manuscript may not have been cited as many times, but it may have been read by thousands and thousands of people. So the number of reads is not appreciated with, by these metrics. And then, of course, there are inconsistencies in the source used by different databases, which can result in inconsistencies in those metrics. So why is it important to be cited? To quantify the impact of academic literature and scholarly communication for example, in bibliometrics. For journals, it's very important so that their impact factor can be calculated. For universities and funding bodies, it is really important because it's a way to demonstrate the excellence of the work performed um, in, by their uh, organization. And for researchers, it's very important so as to demonstrate the impact of their work in the, in, at the international community letter level, excuse me, and this way to support their career progression, their recognition by the scientific community, new appointments, tenures, promotions, collaborations, even funding. Uh, being able to demonstrate that your work is impactful is very important in order to get acknowledged, recognized and honored where appropriate for your work. Let's look into more detail about uh, uh, into the importance of promoting your research and how this is directly related to uh, the, the impact of your work. Why is it important to promote your research? First of all, to increase visibility so people become aware of what you do, what you have discovered, what implications this work of yours has. Two, for better research impact in order to, for others to be able to make the most of your findings, to build on them and extend or go in depth into uh, an area that you've already unveiled, you've already discovered, they need to know about it. Higher citations, of course, the more people read and know about your work, the more chances that it will get cited. Scholarly reputation, people need to know what you do in order to recognize the value of your contribution. Better funding opportunities, all funding bodies want to support individuals who have a proven track record of successful uh, research projects. 
And of course, building collaborations. The more people know about you and your work and appreciate your work and admire your work, the more they will want to reach out, get to know you, interact with you, apply for grants with you, collaborate with you, and so on. So what can researchers do to promote their work? There's the conventional methods that we all uh, need to be aware of and refresh our memory on those. And there's the trending methods. There's an evolving list of tools that we now have available in order to promote our research. So under conventional methods, you may already be familiar with um, scholarly collaboration, presenting at conferences or e-conferences nowadays, writing review articles and citing your own research where appropriate. But then we have trending methods, a number of trending methods, which include uh, using social media networks, using professional networks, making papers more accessible, using open access versions of uh, um, and uh, different servers, and of course, getting an ORCID yourself. Let's look now into more detail um, into the conventional methods for promoting one's research. First of all, the impact of international collaboration on citation count. So international collaborations, it goes without saying, can help tremendously to boost your citations because you have your own uh, large network of individuals who know about your work and they will be talking and citing and presenting maybe parts of your collaboration to their own networks and colleagues around the world. The average number of citations received by, uh, per article, it has been shown that it increases with each additional collaborating country. And that's a very interesting piece of information that directly proves this point. The more international your network, the more collaborations you have around the globe, the more likely that you have a bigger, higher number of citations for your work. And then, the effective correlation of scholarly collaboration and citation boost is much stronger for developing countries the more international collaborations they are involved in. Now, if we were to look at a graphical representation of the impact uh, of international collaboration, you would see here how um, the field weighted citation impact correlates with international collaboration and you can see in this graph how uh, they go hand in hand and as the uh, percent of international collaboration increases you have an increase in the field weighted citation impact. Now another approach is presenting your work at conferences, live conferences, in person or online. The online offers a fantastic opportunity for people who may have not been otherwise able to travel or present uh, to present their work. So there's a lot more opportunity to do this with fewer financial means because you don't have to travel as much and um, without as much time, the time that we used to need to devote to travel sometimes on the other side of the globe in order to give our presentation. So hybrid conferences or online conferences are increasing tremendously the opportunities to participate and present your work. So um, these conference conferences as a whole are a great opportunity to, uh, first of all, get an overview of ongoing research in the field, strengthen your research network and build collaborations, meet experts and get feedback on research work, and of course, create interest among participants about your research work. Now, of course, when we're talking about the online version of conferences, you have less face-to-face -face interaction and we very much need more tools and approaches to have the opportunity to meet individuals online in the context of those conferences, those electronic conferences. However, there's always the traditional, the live meetings that are taking place, and there you can use all the traditional classical approaches of reaching out 
to other experts in your field, getting to know them, expanding your network. Now, when it comes to citing your previous work, very important to do so when and where appropriate. You don't want to oversight uh, your work and you don't want to have um, uh, an unfounded number of self-citations. So do cite your work if the current study is a continuation of previous work that you've done or if it's based on it. So obviously there's a direct link, there's very valid reasons for uh, citing it. The ratio of uh, the number of self-cites to external ones is comparable to that of others in the field so that you don't have a manuscript that's full of citations of your previous work disregarding other publications that are important in this field. And also, if a researcher is building a coherent piece of work in a given field, so if it really makes sense to cite this uh, work of yours, this previous work of yours. But let's also look at some trending methods for promoting research because there's so many opportunities that one can now capitalize on. And I'd like to start with uh, the importance of carefully selecting your keywords. And the reason I'm emphasizing this point is because when we go on Google and we start searching for different pieces of information, we search with keywords. So if you have managed to use the most appropriate keywords for your work, then more people are likely to come by it when they perform their different searches. So search engine optimization is very important in ensuring that a work appears as high as possible in search engine results. Most likely, the person seeking a certain piece of information will not go through 10, 15 different pages on uh, a Google search. They'll probably go through the first page, maybe through the second, um, and many, much fewer times beyond that. So keywords can really help the peers in your field search for a paper using various abstracting and indexing services. So authors must, be, uh, must use established subject specific and index standardized terms as keywords because this increases the chances of the person out there seeking for a specific piece of information will be able to identify their work, your work and consequently cite it. Use the same keywords and phrases repeatedly in the title and the abstract because this increases the chances of your specific piece of work coming up at the very top of a search. Making a paper more accessible. This is really important. It's so frustrating and it really decreases the chances of one's work being cited when the community, the scientific community, is searching for it, but they can only find the title, but not really the full text. So share the free ePrints, share data on various platforms like Figshare or Dirad, self-archive in institutional or subject-based repositories or personal servers or profile pages, and try to publish in open access journals to increase uh, the chances of people being able to access it, access the full text, use the full text, and therefore cite your um, work. It's very easy and fast and important to also create an ORCID ID. ORCID is a persistent identifier to distinguish researchers from each other. So especially for people who have high chances of having a common uh, last name or um, common initials and last name, it's very important to have their own ORCID ID. We should all have our own ORCID ID, the same way that manuscripts now have their own DOI, DOI, and can be directly, immediately identified. Same goes for ORCID. It's our scientific ID very much used around the world. It solves the problem of multiple researchers having the same name, as I mentioned, uh, but also many publishers, institutions, and funders have embraced the ORCID ID, which means that they will want to check up on someone's ORCID ID to have a better view of their work. 
ORCID integrates key research workflows of researchers, such as manuscripts and grant submissions, and it also knits together scholarly collaboration networks and wider industry tools. So it's really a, something to, to bear in mind and go ahead with if you haven't already uh, done so. Writing and maintaining a blog can also be very useful. A blog is a forum to check new ideas and promote publications to different audiences. Authors can use it to provide regular updates, highlight their research, provide links to published work, etc. It's uh, uh, depending on the different tools uh, one uses. Um, you can have different ways to creative ways to to decorate if you want uh, your blog to attract attention um, different ways to to capture your audience so the title and headline you choose must be carefully designed to draw the attention of as many readers as possible but also you want the the scientific context to be content to be robust but also you want the uh, a visually appealing experience for uh, the people who visit your blog. So try to keep it as neat and organized, easy to, to read, enjoyable to read, enjoyable to visit. Writers in a blog can share information about work in progress as well as work that's been completed and published, but Keeping it regularly updated is important because this maintains a momentum and maintains a systematic interaction with um, your um, readers, your, your followers, if you want. And also, through a blog, authors can share feedback for work done by other researchers and therefore start an interaction that could even potentially turn into a collaboration in the future. Another thought to consider is creating your own website or a website for your lab, for your team, a website for a specific project of yours, but a website where more information can be presented. There's many leading labs and researchers in the world that have their own uh, websites, and often this is very useful to include in grant applications reference to your uh, professional website or your labs or your team's professional website. These websites, it's advisable to provide information such as the following. What are the current research projects? What's the ongoing focus of your work? So what information will people be able to find there? Um, if it's a personal website, it's important to provide some information about your educational background. Who are you? Where are you coming from? Past and current affiliations and positions. This helps people get to know who you are. Uh, individual and group achievements, this helps people appreciate the importance of the work that you do. Publications in a chronological order so people can follow the progress of your work and have a better understanding where you're coming from when you talk and present your latest publications and achievements. You can list key collaborators. Again, this is a way to promote your um, research network and potentially attract more members to this network of yours. It's nice and useful to list students, postdoctoral fellows and other staff, the members in your lab, for multiple reasons. This gives credit to their work, to their contribution, demonstrates how much you appreciate their role in the team, but also when they move on to different positions, it will always be known that you've been part of their education, of their training. So when they end up becoming professors and directors in other research centers, there will be this piece of evidence there that you made a contribution towards this direction. And of course, in such a website, you need to acknowledge, uh, you should acknowledge, and it gives you credit to acknowledge the funding sources that have enabled you to perform your work. Now, what about digital media networking and how can this be helpful for us? How to use digital media? So there are several different steps one can take. First of all, create and maintain an online profile, engage in scholarly communications networks, 
build a social networking profile, monitor progress, and measure success. Some examples of uh, tools, uh, websites that you can use to do that uh, would be academia.edu. It's a platform where you can share your research, monitor the impact of your publications, follow other academics, and link your profile to other social media accounts. Another one that's also very well known and widely used is ResearchGate, where again, you can share your research, join discussion groups, so you have this aspect of interaction, follow other academics, get a ResearchGate uh, score, and of course, they, each one of those has a number of other um, capabilities that they, and tools that they offer. So they're definitely worth exploring, and uh, it's worth for you determining how you can make the most of them, uh, depending on your needs. There are several reference management tools that you can use to uh, prepare your citations and to manage your own references. Some uh, prime examples would be Mendeley, Redcube, Site You Like, and Zotero. So um, Mendeley would be a, um, one of the available options to manage references, connect with fellow researchers, share unpublished data, start and uh, or participate in a discussion, and also monitor the impact of your work. Uh, ReadCube would be a great place to find, read, manage, and cite references. Cite you like is another tool to find, share, and manage papers, but also article recommendations are provided there. And then Zotero, another example, uh, a great tool to collect, organize site references, as well as share and collaborate with peers. So you see how uh, there's an overlap, but also some unique characteristics in each one of the available tools. And of course, I need to emphasize that these are just examples. There's many more tools out there. And if you devote just a little bit of time searching the ones that you enjoy using the best, um, and the ones that can best fulfill, uh, help you fulfill your goals, then um, you will have a good toolbox in place to get you started. Now, Google Scholar is something that uh, everybody needs to be aware of. It's one of the most popular online search engines for scholarly literature. You've probably used it already. Researchers can create their own profiles via Google Scholar citations, and it keeps researchers updated about new research in the field, as well as helping to monitor citations to published work. So it's out there, it's freely available, very easy to use, and um, it, it not only it shows some uh, summary, a list of all your publications, for example. It also calculates and demonstrates, uh, provides graphs of the citations that each one of your publications has received, the citations you've been receiving every year, uh, the age index that you have uh, currently or in the past, the I-10 index, uh, etc. So it's a helpful tool. It's something that people visit a lot. So go for it, uh, make your account, um, it's easy, it's out there. People will have good chances of uh, identifying you and seeing your work in Google Scholar. Now, LinkedIn, of course, a very well-established platform. It helps researchers uh, connect globally with other scholars, and it helps building an audience for your work. It also helps maintaining relationships uh, with colleagues, peers, and even acquaintances. It's used by millions of people uh, worldwide, and um, indeed, um, uh, it, it it has proven a, a great way to not only stay connected but also find uh, jobs, um, create networks, collaborations, etc. Something definitely to to consider when you're building your armamentarium of different um, tools. So, um, how to use LinkedIn to promote your work? Let's look uh, into this in a little more detail. You can make a powerful 
and concise profile and it's best if it's concise because then people will have more chances of reading it people who don't know you uh, it's a great way and you need to find ways to highlight your work there uh, in a way that is appropriate is objective and it's attractive you can add videos presentations documents you can include your ORCID ID you can showcase honors and awards you have received and it's a great way to demonstrate publicly the progress of your work then there's twitter everybody knows of twitter is the largest microblogging platform in the world it helps to keep track of emerging trends generate discussions get feedback and help disseminate research it helps authors build reputation within their research area and strengthen their work. So definitely worth considering it as one of those tools available for you out there to promote your research. The role of Twitter in science publication and communication, not trivial at all. And in this graphic, you can see how many different roles it plays in uh, the scientific world from uh, sharing ideas, starting discussions, enabling and promoting collaboration, giving ideas for experimentation, um, announcing uh, publications, promoting publications, disseminating discoveries, reaching out to individuals for information, for collaborations, um, for um, publicizing uh, um, and educating. Uh, the broader audience. So many different roles that uh, Twitter can play. Definitely worth considering. Uh, it's interesting to note some of the statistics uh, in this page. 55% of uh, followers are scientists, science students, scientific organizations. Um, the Twitter, obviously, as you know, is free and vastly increases professional network size and diversity. And 55% of academic Twitter users received their PhD, uh, received their PhD less than five years ago. This gives you um, an uh, idea of the audience that you'll be reaching out to. And of course, median Twitter following is 730 times larger than median university department size. So again, valuable uh, little pieces of information to show you how Twitter could have a big impact. And then there's Facebook. Uh, it provides opportunities to promote your research work. It's so common among those who have Facebook accounts to announce a new publication, a new discovery, uh, a new assignment uh, that they've undertaken, new positions or awards. All this is promoting your work and it's easy for others to uh, share it with their network. So a very fast way to uh, promote your work to a long chain um, of other scientists in the same or other fields. It's easy for researchers to share links uh, of recently published work, of relevant news, to link to, to an award announcement. So you can directly, you can provide them through your um, uh, uh, announcement, direct access to the source of this information, be it the abstract, the conference where you're giving a presentation, the actual journal where your manuscript has been published, etc. A recent survey, it's interesting to note, in Nature showed that 15% of surveyed scientists are regular Facebook users and over 20% of them post work-related content. Oh, this can vary from uh, different uh, among different countries and uh, it depends to a large extent on the preferences of the individual, but it's certainly a trend that appears to be increasing over time, promoting research through these digital um, uh, tools that are available to us. Then there's YouTube, something you may or have not thought of as a way to promote your research, but preparing a short animated video based on a research study and posting it on YouTube can help improve the visibility of your research. 
posting vlogs uh, regarding a research study or related topic can create interest among the viewers. And you, this way, you may be reaching out to, to viewers, um, to audiences that are more likely to use YouTube or more frequently use YouTube to access uh, information. And of course, the link to a research paper, to the research paper or the research papers that you're making the video about can always be integrated inside the video so people can see it and use it to access your work. So this way you're really expanding the approaches that you're using and as a consequence, the audiences that you're reaching out to. And how do we track the progress? There's different tools available. Some of us may be more aware of them than others, but there are several different tools that are definitely worth considering and uh, looking into further. There's the impact story, there's Altmetric, Plum Analytics, all different tools that help you measure uh, and view the statistics of your work in different ways. For example, Altmetric actually appears automatically uh, in some journals next to different articles, and it can show you how many times this article has been tweeted or blogged, or how many Facebook pages refer to it, how many Google posts it has, um, how many readers on Mendeley, etc. So different tools are available to help you track progress and this makes it more exciting if you want and easier to track uh, the progress. And um, let's look into impact story. First, uh, we have um, what can impact story offer allow researchers to discover metrics for their work from scholarly and popular social media it allows to import papers data sets software slide decks and other scholarly products into a single profile I like allows third-party services like Figshare or Orsid etc to get connected to the account and get automatic updates and import new research and researchers can get an idea of who is benchmarking, recommending, saving, and citing their work by analyzing all the different metrics that are available. And researchers through these tools can also highlight their key achievements on the profile page that is available. Now, what about Altmetric? As we mentioned earlier on as an example, it helps to gather data from social media sources, blogs, mainstream media, and reference tools. Um, researchers can monitor online activity and discussion in real time and have a closer and more live, if you want, um, appreciation of the impact of their work. The altmetric data can be included in progress reports or to endorse profiles. It helps researchers benchmark their activities against others in the field. And uh, it enables researchers to receive alerts each time the work is mentioned, which can build the momentum and excitement to see um, the broader impact almost on real time that your work is having. Then there's the altmetric score, which is an indicator of the attention received uh, by an article. And then we mentioned Plum Analytics. Let's look what, at what this can offer. So it accumulates research metrics for all types of scholarly research output. The metrics are categorized into five groups, usage, uh, captures, mentions, social media, and citations. It tracks 67 types of output, including books, book chapters, posters, and tracks multiple versions of the same article, such as the preprints and the published green open access, etc., which is also important. Um, and then it categorizes metrics for clear understanding and analysis and offers relatively more sources of metrics. So, we have a three-step promotion strategy. 
create an ORCID, use academic social networks, make your website and write blogs. So this is a way to introduce yourself if you want and open up discussions. There's the dissemination step through collaborations by presenting at conferences, writing review articles, sharing your data and figures, citing your previous research, and then tracking progress. How is your work and the promotion of your work progressing? And this is by using traditional metrics and alternative metrics and making the most of the tools that are available for you out there. So it's a combination of being active, having a strategy, identifying the tools and the platforms that serve you and your best uh, and, and your interests best, and making the strategy, the time plan to incorporate them in your daily life so as to make the most of them. So it's both having the know-how, the determination and the um, persistence to continue with this plan and see it through. Let's have a quick summary now of what we have been discussing. Cite your previous work when it is relevant to your new article. Citations are important. Choose your keywords wisely so that they can appear in a database. Uh, uh, they can appear in database searches that they come up and they come at the top or as close to the top as possible. Try to repeat keywords and phrases in title and abstract so as to increase uh, the chances that it comes to the top of the list. Make sure that you use your name consistently. Uh, it sounds very simple, but it can create a lot of problems in the accidental cases when it's not. And try to remember to use your ORCID ID. Have an ORCID ID, use it consistently. This is an identifier you can't go wrong with. All your work will be connected to that. Submit your pre or post publication prints to a popular repository um, so as to increase accessibility of your article. It's not enough to just uh, submit it and publish it, try to promote it, make it accessible. People won't cite it easily if they can only read the title or the abstract. They often need to see the whole thing and that's how you'll increase your chances of getting citations. Share your data on websites like Figshare to self-archive your articles and to increase the citation counts. Increase the visibility of your work among researchers by presenting uh, in conferences and seminars. Try to participate in such opportunities. They're fantastic for getting to know what others do in the field, reaching out, as well as sharing what you do, what you have achieved, and attracting interest towards you and your work. Use social media. They're out there. They're available. Such a big range of different um, uh, media for you to share the links of your published manuscripts and promote your research. Have your own strategy, the steps, prioritize which steps serve you best, maybe at different times of your career, maybe in different phases uh, of the year, depending what your goals are. Options to create a blog or a website dedicated to your work. But also all the different tools that are out there. Make your selection, decide at which time you it would it would be best to use each one of them and how it's non-trivial the time required to keep updating all these different um, uh, media um, and and tool and tools so it's important and that's why i keep referring to it not just to be aware of them to create a blog and never populate it you have to make a strategy that's realistic for you based on the time you have available, based on what will be more pleasant for you to use, and therefore you'll be more likely to keep up with it. It's quite disappointing to have accounts that you never use, so when people actually reach it, they reach a data end because it hasn't been updated for, for ages. So choose the ones that you enjoy using and you will be using so that you build a momentum an interaction, you build your audience, you build your network, and you as well as they enjoy this interaction. 
and of course write review papers uh, or press releases when and where possible and appropriate to showcase uh, the evolution of your research or a new grant that you have received or the progress of this grant and its impact in the broader community. Uh, but when talking about review papers in specific, usually review papers have higher chances of being cited and through these review papers people can get more familiar with your work as a broad. Uh, as, a, as, a, um, as a whole. So all these different tools, traditional or not, uh, electronic or paper, written or oral, many different tools available for you to choose from and go ahead to cite the word of others and attract citations for your own work, but also collaborations and the generation of a beautiful network that will promote your research and open new opportunities, new doors for you uh, with new opportunities for the future. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to discussing the questions you may have. Thank you, Despina, for, the, for such wonderful informative session. We are now open to taking questions. We request all the attendees to kindly send us their queries using the questions tab in the control panel. The first question is, please explain meta-analysis. Thank you. Um, for some reason, I'm having a problem seeing the question. So yes, if you can please read them for me, it would be fantastic. Thank you. So meta-analysis yeah. is uh, uh, actually an entire field of research where you're using data that have already been made publicly um, available from different sources and you are analyzing them, you're filtering, choosing which ones are appropriate to answer specific new scientific specific questions and you're analyzing them all together. So a new analysis with a lot of data from different sources. Uh, filtered, normalized appropriately in order to answer a new scientific question. So this takes, um, um, this needs uh, specific expertise and uh, specific statistics or bioinformatical tools to perform. All right, the second question is, are open access journals better than paid ones? Where would, where would be the better impact? Uh, Better is a relative word. Uh, thank you for, for this question. So it depends on what means by better. Uh, there are many very high impact uh, journals that are either open or um, uh, on a fee for service uh, basis. Uh, they have a um, uh, different um, charging actually um, uh, rules. However, the open access um, versions uh, of manuscripts have a lot more chances of being cited because they're more easily accessible to a broader audience. So if better refers to what will people cite more frequently, they will cite more frequently what they can have access to. And since more people, everybody basically, has access to the open access journals and manuscripts, you increase your chances of being cited. But I do not want this to mis be misinterpreted as using the word better for the quality of a journal. It's used only for chances of getting cited. The next and Desvina, question is... You, uh, yep. Actually, Sneha, if I could like chime in there. Desvina, I think you make a really good point, right? In that, um, you know, just because a journal is open access does not attribute the value of the quality of the journal. So it's important for that researcher or whoever is um, downloading that content to investigate the quality of the journal and understanding the peer review process that the journal goes through when publishing that content 
Um, and so, you know, I think there is a definite valuation to what better looks like, but it's not based on whether a journal is publishing open access or whether there is a subscriber requirement for people to access that content. So that's a really important point that I think the audience should take home with them is to really understand the, the peer review process that the journals are using when publishing their content. Very true. Thank you, Shannon, for elaborating on this. It's, it's very important to clarify this. Right. Uh, the next question is, how do you cite a citation from the secondary source? A citation from a secondary source. Uh, so you mean if you've read in a paper about a third paper? Uh, it, it depends on what information you will be talking about. So if you're talking purely about the original source of the information, then you cite that original source. If you are talking about a conclusion that uh, the intermediate, if you want, source uh, made based on the original, then you cite the conclusion of the intermediate source. If you're referring to points that different points that these two publications made, then you're referring to both of them. I hope that's clear and I hope I understood the question right. Uh, the next question is, are there any apps to monitor your progress for free? To monitor your own personal progress. It, it depends on the different, well, there's different apps that measure different aspects of your progress. So for example, on Google Scholar, you can see how your age index and your citations are progressing over time. In altmetrics, you can measure um, uh, the metrics for specific metrics, a broad range of metrics for uh, your different articles. So it really depends, and there's many, many um, other tools available out there that it's really worth investing a little bit of time to search, but it, it greatly depends on what aspects of your progress you want measured. The next question is, if an article is published in a journal that is not open access, can the author still upload it on ResearchGate? Uh, there's very specific rules that come uh, uh, from different publishers, and it's very important to uh, be aware of those rules and respect them. So um, different publishers will be very specific as to how you should approach this. So please check with the journal every time. You, you may be allowed to upload on specific uh, servers, but not others. You may not be allowed to upload, or they may give you a time window uh, where you tell you you can upload it before or after that time point. So uh, check with the journal, the very specific journal and publisher you'll be publishing at. The next question is, what social media have you chosen for your own research? So uh, for me personally, time is a big issue because I have a very broad range of, of major commitments. So I prefer to use media that do not require day-to-day -day updating. I use Facebook, I use um, LinkedIn sometimes, Facebook more frequently, um, a website uh, for our team and a personal website. But this is very personal and it uh, it really depends where in the world you are and what the audience you're aiming at is more likely to, to use to find you. Uh, Shannon, would you want to share your input? Uh, yeah, so um, from a publisher standpoint or a professional society standpoint, you know, we have uh, we, we use pretty much all of the social media platforms. We have Twitter, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, I will tell you from a professional society standpoint, we see a lot of engagement on LinkedIn and Twitter. That's where um, most of our, our community lives. Um, I think once publishers and researchers get into more of the habit of sharing content visually, then I think that's an area for Instagram to, to service that. 
Um, but for right now, I, you know, when I'm looking at how are we going to reach the most, the largest number of people in our community, we're looking at LinkedIn and Twitter because that's where most of our community lives um, as far as engagement and when they're sharing their research. All right. The next question is, what can be done to have citations for the search paper that are uploaded on Org ID and Google Scholar? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question here. Um, you mean how to attract citations? Uh, because in terms of how to attract citations, you can use any or all of the approaches that we have discussed, promoting your research as a whole or promoting specific papers that you've published through all the different avenues that we discussed are ways to attract more citations to your work. I'm not sure if this was the question, but please rephrase if uh, it wasn't. The next question is, what is the most adequate frequency of updating the profiles? Does it change depending on tools? Yes, that is very much the case. Uh, for example, uh, on Facebook, you can choose the frequency uh, yourself. If you have a blog, you need to maintain the momentum uh, in order for your um, the people who follow it to, to have a sense as to how frequently to to check up with you uh, Twitter again it's nice to have a more frequent um, uh, interaction with your network so it really depends on the platform that you're using and of course weighing in what information do you have to share how often do you have new pieces of information to share uh, be it your discovery or just commenting on something interesting and relevant that you saw and how much time you have to devote in updating each of these platforms. And that's why I think it's very important to develop your own strategy, promotion strategy. What serves you, all aspects of you and your daily life and your professional goals to consider together. The next question is, how do you suggest to cite retracted papers? You pointed out to cite also controversial research. A remark would also be careful about copyright. Example, Elsevier has lawyers that take down PDFs from ResearchGate, etc. Okay, so first of all, about retracted papers, I would not cite them. They've been retracted. Uh, Two, when it comes to controversial topics, certainly in research, there are controversial um, um, findings. There are disagreements in the literature. There's people who have, may have found the exact opposite uh, 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 result. They've had the exact opposite result, even if they've been looking at the very same scientific question. So it really depends. Um, on what you're writing about. But in those cases where there are ongoing controversies in the field, it's important to demonstrate that you are aware of those controversies. Uh, you understand that they are there, you appreciate them. If you have an opinion uh, based on your discoveries and based on your knowledge, you can express it. But in those cases, you cite all sides of this controversy, the people who find uh, found A and support A and the people who found B and support B, because this demonstrates your understanding of the field. And then if you want where you position yourself and where your findings uh, contribute in this potential debate in your field. Uh, but this was a very long question and it had another aspect to it as well. So Sneha, would you like to read the second part of that question? Please. Sure, I'll do that. Uh, I remark would also be uh, also be to be careful about copyright. Example, Elsevier's has lawyers that can take down PDFs from ResearchGate. Okay, so when when you're citing, if we're still talking about citing one's work, uh, you're citing the work, so you're not. Uh, copying or reproducing that work 
So you don't have any issues there. When it comes to uploading your work, this brings us back to a previous question where you can't upload any work of yours anywhere unless you have the full copyrights or permission for whoever has, maybe the publisher or whoever has the copyrights of your work. So this is something that you need to clarify before uploading um, any work where you don't have full copyrights, yes. All right, we do have a clarification from the uh, attendee for the previous ORC and Google Scholar question. So she says that she has uploaded uh, a lot of papers in on ORC ID and Google Scholar as well, but after a year, the citation is zero still. Can you suggest how to improve? Of course, through all the different avenues that we discussed uh, in this presentation. That's what this presentation was all about. So promote your research, use Facebook, use uh, Instagram, as Shannon mentioned, use Twitter, use conferences to present your work. People need to be made aware of it. Uh, so try to build a network and reach out within and beyond that network to make people aware of your research. It's, it's not just a matter of making it appear in ORCID uh, as a paper or making it appear um, in Google Scholar. You need to use as many avenues as possible until you find the ones that uh, are best suited for you because maybe the audience uh, that should be reached for this specific area that you're working on has not been reached through the specific avenue that you are pursuing. So not everybody uses all the tools and you may find that specific scientific communities are more keen to use some or others um, of the tools available. All right. Did Justina, you find actually, actually, sorry. Uh, if I could just chime in there um, for this for this attendee, I, you know, you make a really good point. I think one of the other options, uh, whether you want to consider this a shameless plug or not, um, is getting involved with scholarly societies like the Electrochemical Society, like American Chemical Society or Materials Research Society, because we work on building those networks of researchers, whether that is through publications or holding conferences, honors and awards, membership. Um, and so that's that's our goal is to service those communities and to publish and promote that research. So, you know, it's it doesn't necessarily always have to focus on the social media aspect, but in today's day and age, social media plays a huge part in that. Um, the, the other piece is getting involved in that community in particular. So figuring out where that research lives, what is what active community. Um, what organization supports that and seeing if there are avenues to get engaged with those groups. Yes, very, very, very true. I was hoping you would make this uh, comment, Shannon. Yeah, no problem. All right, uh, the last question uh, for today, and due to time constraints, we will have to end the session. However, we've made a note of all the questions that we've received, and we will send an email response uh, as soon as possible. The last question is, importance in choosing a research topic for getting more citation? Ah, excellent, excellent question. That's a whole different talk in itself, uh, but, um, it's very important to align what your specific scientific interests are with what are the trends in your field. The closer these two are aligned, then the more popular the outcome of your research will be, especially the more significant your findings are. Uh, but this, of course, varies considerably uh, at, among different fields and among different uh, across different times. So it takes uh, a lot of reading, an understanding of the literature, close follow-up of the literature to know exactly where your field stands currently and being able to identify either alone or together with your mentors or together with highly esteemed collaborators or colleagues of yours, being able to appreciate what are the most cutting edge questions, scientific questions in that area and which ones of them would be realistic for you to try and address. Uh, along these lines, it's important to consider popular trending approaches to answering different questions, popular tools to use or not just popular, but cutting edge tools to use. So you're right there 
uh, at the forefront of development in your area. And in this process, it's important to choose your partners carefully because inevitably you won't be an expert on everything. Not all the methodologies, all the cutting edge methodologies or all the cutting edge approaches that may need to be integrated in order to address cutting edge questions. So that's where you need a solid network of um, experts that you have good communication with uh, and a, a good fruitful interaction with. All right. Thank you, Despina and Shannon. Our attendees have certainly gained a lot of critical information from this session. We would once again like to thank all the attendees for joining the webinar. Please find the discount codes for our editing and publication support services in the chat box. We would also request you all to please fill the feedback survey displayed after you leave the webinar. Your participation will allow us to evaluate the effectiveness of our webinar. Have a good day. Thank you.